Brothers and sisters, good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. On behalf of the Spencer family, we would like to express appreciation for your support and your attendance here today. My name is President Ralph Spencer of the Linden 25th Branch. It's been my privilege to be Gary and Diane's branch president for the last little while. It is my privilege also to be able to conduct the services for Gary Owen Spencer today. We would like to thank Judy, Joey, Jody Coons, a granddaughter for the beautiful freedom of music. She also will accompany our music here today. We'd like to recognize Sharon Del Cruz, a daughter, as our chorister today. The family prayer was given by Farah Burton, a daughter. We'll begin the services this morning by singing hymn number 335, Brightly Beams, Our Father's Mercy, after which we'll have an invitation offered by Sean Christiansen, a daughter. We'll go to that point. Sarah, 
Following Sherilyn's comments, we'll have a speaker, a son, Lance Spencer. It will be privileged to have a special musical number by all our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I am a child of God. They will be accompanied by Holly Jukes, a granddaughter. Following the special musical number, we'll be privileged to hear from sons Troy Spencer and Lane Spencer. We will go to that point in the service. Thank you all for being here. Um, <clears throat> I'm hoping I don't read this too fast. Gary Owen Spencer was born to Jesse Owen and Arthella Mitchell Spencer on September 4th, 1931, in the family home in Escalante, Utah. He was delivered by his aunt Susan, the town's midwife. He was the second child born to the family. His sister Arda was born the year before. He had four younger siblings, Sherry, the twins, Rolo and Rodney, and Stephen. He was a good brother and son, and he loved them immensely, and was very proud. He was very proud of his parents, and his siblings, and their children. When he was growing up in this family, he provided special surprises for his mother each wash day. All of his overalls needed to be turned upside down and shaken vigorously to expel all the little red mice, snakes, and frogs he had accumulated during the week. In fifth grade, he had his own horse, a beautiful black bull mare called Horse. No saddle was available, so he rode everywhere bareback and became pretty good at it. The hills above Escalante were a great place to explore. Especially interesting were the deserted Moki Caves. One day, he made an extraordinary discovery, a large cache of arrowheads, which he showed to his class the next day. His teacher was so impressed, she quickly hid them in her desk drawer, and he never saw them again. Moki relics were highly prized. When he was old enough to go to the mountains with a sheep herd for summer pasture, he would accompany his dad on the trip. One day he was walking along the bottom of the ravine, shooing the wandering sheep up to higher ground, when suddenly he came face to face with a huge black bear, eating berries by the side of the stream. He must have been downwind of the bear, and the bear didn't smell or hear him coming. The bear reared up on its hind legs and growled. Dad hollered and turned and ran in the opposite direction, yelling to his dad, 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 a bear. The bear ran the other direction. Grandpa Spencer got one shot off at the bear before he disappeared. Gary stayed pretty close to the camp for the next few days. Then there was a drought in Esplani. No water, no crops, no food. So his parents sold what they could. But had to leave most of the furniture and personal items behind. They moved to Sydney. First, and stayed for about a year, and then up to Ogden, where Gary attended a new school each year for three years. Most of his Ogden years were spent in Washington Terrace, where he went swimming, rafting, and walked along the water pipe that hung over the canyon. He got a job setting pins at a local bowling alley and acted as an usher at the Egyptian Theater. He attended Weaver High School and became a member of the debate team and took many awards. He also became student body president his senior year. After high school, he enrolled at Weaver College and continued with debate. By the second quarter, the draft was pursuing all young men for the Korean conflict, and he enlisted in the Air Force. He was accepted into the cadets, but after clipping a few fences with landings, they moved him to intelligence on a secret base in New Mexico. Not even his mother or father knew where he was. He was trained as a special agent in Air Force Intelligence Division. He trained with weaponry, machine guns, tanks, bazookas, self-defense, and the defensive forces for all atomic storage bases in the United States. It was during these years in the service in New Mexico that with every furlough or time off duty, he was out exploring, digging, and perhaps a little uranium or gold hunting. He actually found two uranium deposits, one he sold. He also spent time looking for the canyon of Little Doors or Adam's Dune and Adam's Dance. Dad was kind of an Indiana Jones. In the desert looking for things undiscovered. 
he saved his money faithfully and purchased a brand new Oldsmobile before being discharged. After his armed forces service, he decided to go to BYU. However, his home ward called him to serve a mission in the Central States, so he sold his blue Oldsmobile to finance his mission and headed, headed for Independence, Missouri under President Alvin R. Dyer. He served in Raleigh, Missouri, El Dorado, Arkansas, and Springfield, Missouri, baptizing about 30 new members of the church. After being released from the Central States Mission, he was called to serve another mission in upstate New York. The program that President Dyer had developed was so successful that they asked him to present it to the New York Mission. He served there for over a year and was chosen to be a narrator at the Hill Kamura pageant that year. After being released, he needed to go to work to earn money to enroll again at BYU, so he worked for an agency, ad agency, advertising agency in New York to pay for school. Arriving back in Provo, he met up with an old missionary companion and took a ride with him one Sunday afternoon and met Diane Tucker. She later invited him to the preference ball at BYU, where incidentally, he was named the most preferred man on campus. <laughs> they dated till school was out in June, and then he moved to California to refurbish his school funds. Diane just happened to go to spend the summer with her cousin in California, and Gary and Diane met again in the California ward. When they returned that fall to BYU, he decided he couldn't live without her and asked him to marry him. They eloped to Las Vegas. <laughs> Their first house was in Salt Lake City, and his first job was at J.C. Penney's accounting office. Their first and second children, Farah Diane and Corey Owen, were born while they lived in a duplex in Salt Lake City. Gary then took a job at Prudential Federal Savings, and later that year got an offer to go with American Savings and Loan as a branch manager of their Granger office. And best of all, a house came with a job, no down payment. Gary joined the Chamber of Commerce and became president. He joined the Rotary Club and the JCs. He was called at the same time to become the Scoutmaster, which he served with great gusto. He then was called as Young Men's President, the Great Ranger State Mission President, the State High Council, and the State Executive Secretary. During this time, Diane was rearing four more children, Lance T, Sean N, Troy, and Lane. After 11 years with American Savings, he decided to go out on his own. They sold their home, moved into a rental in Murray, and began building a new home in Taylorsville. After a year in the rental and another son named Brian Burnett, he got called into the bishopric in Murray. So they sold the house they were building and bought another home in Murray to fulfill his calling. It was in this house they lived 17 years and had three more children, Sharon, Sherilyn, and Trent. After another turn as scoutmaster, he was again called into another bishopric. For Murray, they bought a lot in South Jordan and began building another new home, this time with all the sons to help. After receiving a mission call to serve in St. George's genealogy library, they again sold their home and purchased a condo in Saratoga Springs to move in after the mission. After their mission, they celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, and they served another mission with the American Fork Employment Center. They continued to serve in the ward and support and love their children. Then they moved into an assisted living center in London to facilitate their need for support. They celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary just two years ago. Dad admired and respected his parents. and often talked about the great people they were. He loved his and his wife's siblings, and was always so proud of all of their accomplishments. He praised his nieces and nephews as well. He was a man of honor. I imagined him being the living embodiment of a knight at the round table, seeking to hold that pole all that was honorable and noble. He always treated others with respect. No, sir. Yes, sir. Even sometimes when I didn't think they deserved it. He was a hard worker and did whatever honorable thing that was required to earn it. 
and living for his family. He served in his church calling, callings with great intention. He wanted to serve the God he loved to the best of his ability. He loved his country. And taught all of his children to love his great country and its origins. He was a good and loyal friend. He adored his wife and always called her the best part of his life. He was truly devoted to her. His whole life centered around his wife and children. All of his time and money went to them. His hobbies were his children and grandchildren. And he loved spending time with them, either fishing, target shooting, making rubber band guns, and sharing his love of Louis L'Amour books and John Wayne movies. We never doubted that God and then his family were his first priorities. He was an inventor, an amateur archaeologist, a gun enthusiast, a sportsman, a version of John Wayne, and an avid reader. He was always reading up on things that he was interested in. His thirst for knowledge followed him to the end. He bought math programs to brush up his skills in the last years of life. He told his granddaughters he liked smart girls, and he liked pretty gar girls, but he liked pretty smart girls best. Always encouraging the building of one's mind with knowledge and to be honorable. The world lost a great mind, a noble man, a patriot to his country, a devoted family man, and a God-fearing man. His light shines on with all those he touched and influenced. Thank you, Gary Owen Spencer. Thank you for joining us today. Celebrate my dad's life. God, our Heavenly Father, is the literal father of our spirits, and Christ, his firstborn son, our elder brother. We stood with them in the free existence, and I like to think that we were all there when we heard our Father declare, For behold, this is my word and my glory, to bring to pass the eternal life, <clears throat> immortality and eternal life of men. Our Heavenly Father had achieved immortality and eternal life in a perfected, resurrected body, and as he declared it, <clears throat> it was his desire that we should become like him. Knowing our all-knowing and wise father had achieved ultimate joy, and as an infinitely good father, he wanted us to become like him, and thus share that joy. However, in our pre-existent state, we could see that there were differences between ourselves and our spirit father. Differences that had to be overcome if this plan was to be fulfilled. First, God had a body, a glorified, perfect physical body that gave him certain capacities that we did not have. Second, he had power, intelligence, and knowledge far beyond ours. And third, he was perfect and had mastered great characteristics that we did not. As his children, we now understood what our father already knew, that we could overcome these differences only through the experience of the mortal existence on a physical earth. This realization and the prospect of gaining physical bodies aroused within us such gratitude and elation that all the hosts of heaven shouted for joy, as recorded in Job 38.7. As I ponder that moment in our pre-existent state, the moment that each and every one of us participated in, I reflect upon the overflowing joy that we felt at the time, when we realized, as his children, that we inherited the glorious potential to become like Him. That we could grow and develop the characteristics and capabilities that He had. And when we fell short, that we could be redeemed through the atoning sacrifice of our perfect brother, Jesus Christ, who would be our Savior, our Advocate, and our Mediator with our Father. We knew and understood that as a natural progression of this great plan, that we would all suffer physical death. 
But because of our Savior's willingness to give His life as the only perfect child of our great God, that all would be resurrected, never to die again, just like our Savior, and be exalted so that we could enjoy unspeakable joy of living the life that He lived. President Joseph F. Smith once stated, I rejoice that I am born to live, to die, and to live again. I thank God for His intelligence. It gives me joy and peace that the world cannot give, neither can the world take away. However, there was also at that time an alternative plan presented by another brother, who was Lucifer, or Satan, who promised something that was a lie from the beginning, a plan that could never exalt any of us, one that would not only take away our agency, but with it, our ability to grow and progress by taking away the struggle by taking away the potential for us to experience pain and sorrow. We know from Holy Writ that one-third of our brothers and sisters who stood with us that day believed and accepted Satan's deceptive plan and chose to follow him and rebel against our Father in Heaven. Thus they were never given the chance to become mortal, and as such never to become exalted like our Father in Heaven. For all of us who chose to follow the Father's plan I do not believe that we were unaware and naive regarding the pain and sorrow that we would feel when this inevitable death passed upon all of us and upon all those who we loved. But some of that joy, some of that joy that we felt at the time was also because we knew that we would have the chance to die, only to be resurrected as perfect beings for eternity. This knowledge of death was both bitter and sweet. As difficult as it is to no longer have the presence of death here in this life, our temporary sorrow is truly swallowed up in the overwhelming joy that we felt when we that we know that we will absolutely see him again. This joy is exponentially magnified when I think about how spectacularly. And marvelously, my dad lived his life. He learned what he needed to and became who he became because of the trials and tribulations throughout his mortal life. As I contemplate his life, I know that there were many sorrows, setbacks, failures, struggles, unachieved dreams, and expectations. But because of these trials, as our wise Heavenly Father had planned, he became the great man that he was. I know this pain and sorrow he experienced in his life was easily eclipsed by the great happiness and joy that he felt throughout his life. Mercifully, our great Father did not intend that all of the promised blessings and the joy that was given to us would only come in the afterlife. But again, in his great wisdom, he allowed us to experience much of this promised joy throughout our mortal life here upon the earth. It is these memories and reflections of happiness that I choose to remember today as we honor this great man and valiant son of God. Like all of us, Dad was not a perfect man, but he was always working towards it, always believing in the promises, staying true to his knowledge of the plan, and faithful to the covenants that would exalt him in eternity. There are so many memories I wish to share, but I will share a few. <clears throat> But I think most who knew him well will recognize and smile just a little bit as you contemplate your own experiences with him. I believe the greatest gift besides life itself that my father gave to all of his children was that there was never, never a time in our lives that we did not know that Dad had a testimony of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And that he loved it with all his heart. He knew God lived, he understood this plan, and he honestly tried to live his life consistent with that knowledge. Although his expression of that faith was important to us, to hear him bear his testimony, and Dad could not talk about his testimony without accompanying fear tears, but hearing that testimony was not as important to us as seeing that testimony in faith in the way that he lived his life. Gary Spencer 
loved the Lord and believed his words, and I am confident that he recognized our Heavenly Father's loving face when he passed into the next life this past week. I'm sure that our Savior's face would also have been familiar to him, because throughout his life he strove to be like him. The other wonderful gift that he gave us as children was the constant expression of how much he loved them all. We grew up hearing him say, say it, and we grew up seeing him demonstrate it. There was nothing, there was nothing we could do that would get you in as much trouble as disrespecting our mother. We all dreaded the occasional statement of wait until your dad gets home <laughs> when we got sassy or disrespectful to mom. Dad loved mom and mom loved dad. What greater blessing can you give to your children? Even though dad didn't achieve all of his dreams in life, he had a lot of them and he was always a big picture guy. He was a dreamer. He was an optimist who believed that he and most of those around him could achieve much. I knew that Dad not only expected me and the rest of my brothers and sisters to do great things, but to be great people. He encouraged others around him to do the same. He always encouraged us to do our best. Not to be the best, but to do our best. And he helped us understand the difference between the two. Dad taught us to believe in the promises, to believe in ourselves, and he made us want to achieve and do great things. As Cheryl Lynn said, Dad always was one of John Wayne's biggest fans, and we've joked over the years that my dad actually thought he was John Wayne. He would talk like him, he would dress like him, and he would act like him at times. If you ever wanted to have a good evening with Dad, you just needed to suggest that you sit down and just watch a good John, movie together, John Wayne movie together, and he was happy. I think Dad tried hard to parent like our Heavenly Father, to follow his example of love, agency, example, and to provide positive rewards or blessings when we were obedient. He was a stern father, unwavering to principles of what was right, what the right thing to do was, and what was not the right thing to do. As the scriptures say, he would quote, yea, yea, and nay, nay. And all of his children and any young scout that had the privilege of having him as a scoutmaster would also remember him saying, boo hiss, when you did something that you should not have. <laughs> Dad grew up in the country and I think he secretly always wanted to be a cowboy. He wore bolo ties, he loved guns and western movies. When we got our first eight track tape player as a family, the first tapes he bought were cowboy camp songs, Sons of the Pioneers, Jim Reeves, and Marty Robbins. He loved music even though he was not a musician. He always went around singing a little song or another. He would sing little jingles from his childhood, like Pepsi Cola hits the spot, 12 full ounces, that's a lot, twice as much for your nickel too, Pepsi Cola is the drink for you. <coughs> Some of his favorite songs that he loved to sing with the family was Manana, Edelweiss, It Ain't Gonna Rain No More, Johnny Bolin, Yellow Bird, and In My Adobe, Hacienda. <laughs> Even Johnny Verbeck got plenty of airtime on our family trips. Dad loved music. Although I had always appreciated as a child when Dad would pray, especially over family dinner, you knew and felt that he was talking to the Lord from his heart. These were long prayers. <laughs> Usually filled with statements of gratitude for the blessings of the beautiful world and the abundant blessings in our lives. Dad was grateful and he knew how to pray to the Lord. I often thought Dad missed his calling in life in regards to his career. Dad should have been an engineer of some type. He was always inventing things, a gold machine, a hydrogen engine, all sorts of contraptions to make life better. Because this was, because this was, he was always tinkering with something, some idea, even if it was building birdhouses out of number 10 cans, or rubber guns that he would make for all the grandkids of family reunions. Dad had an inquisitive and inventive mind. Dad knew how to serve faithfully 
As mentioned earlier, Dad served two missions for the church, one church, one in the Central States Mission and one in the Eastern States Mission. I am confident that he was a powerful and effective missionary, and he talked about it fondly throughout his life. I don't ever remember him sitting in church in congregation with us as a family growing up, because he was always on the stand, or in another word, serving in whatever capacity he had been called to serve. He was always the best home teacher I had ever seen. He cared about his families, and he never missed. Dad always served faithfully and did his best when called. Dad was kind. I don't ever remember Dad being unkind to anyone. He didn't have a lot of time for the hippies in the 60s or other radicals that were part of our growing up years. But even when he disagreed with someone, he always treated others with respect and kindness. As a young man, I was convinced that all the single ladies and widows in our ward growing up had a secret crush on my dad because he was always so kind to them and always cared so much for their needs. When you have a family of 10 children, extravagant vacations are not in the cards for a lot of reasons, but Dad made up for it by taking us into the mountains a lot. We would camp under the stars all over the state of Utah. I don't ever think I ever missed a fathers and sons or a work camp out when I was a child. My summers were an endless visit to Uncle Steve's or Uncle Ed's property to go camping, fishing, hiking. My dad gave us a great childhood memories because he spent time with us. Dad always dressed up. He was classy using an ascot, hence all of the brothers did it. Um, and he always wore a suit jacket when he traveled or went to social events and family reunions. He always said that you should dress up to a level, a level that you're unsure of what, whenever, whatever the dress code was. Dad was a take-charge kind of person, at church, at home, wherever. One story that lives on in our family is when one of my siblings was getting married, along with a lot of other people that day at the Salt Lake Temple. Outside, when we went to take pictures, it was chaotic. Who was next? <clears throat> Etc. Well, Dad took charge, instructing each family who was next, people he didn't know, people he had no idea who they were, where they should stand, how long they had before the next family would start. He even helped straighten a wedding dress train out for one of the brides to help things move along. True story. <laughs> everything in Dad's house had a place, a special place uh, for everything in his house. A special drawer, a special book, a secret little nook or cupboard. If things were not put back where they belonged, there was an inquisition. This trick made its way into our homes when we moved out and bought our own homes. When he came to visit, he would rearrange our cupboards and pantries whenever he came. My wife and I joked last week that Heavenly Father's pantry most certainly looked a little bit different this week. <laughs> As we all honor and pay tribute to my wonderful father, Gary O. Spencer, I thank the Lord for being blessed with such a wonderful father who provided me and my siblings a wonderful lifetime, a lifetime example of faith, service, and love. He will be missed, but, not, but only temporarily, which is what he most firmly believed and taught himself. I will close with two quotes, one from President Joseph F. Smith when he stated, We cannot forget them. We do not cease to love them. They have advanced. We are advancing. We are growing as they have grown. The second from our wonderful living prophet, Russell M. Nelson, today. While we weep, we also rejoice in the glorious resurrection of our Savior. Because of him, our loved ones and friends continue their eternal journey. Our tears of sorrow turn to tears of anticipation. Dad, we look forward with tears of anticipation to seeing you again. In the presence of all those you love, especially our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Jehovah, the firstborn in the spirit and in the flesh, and our great God and Father Elohim, who has made it possible for us to be joined again in eternity in the arms of his love, and in the love of all those on the left. In the name of our loving Redeemer, we be Jesus Christ.
fondest memories of that. I think I had an advantage over some of my students. Um, I happened to be a scout when Dad was called as a scout master one time. And I think that uh, some of my fondest memories stem from that time. I remember driving up Parties Canyon in the back of a pickup truck. The wind blowing in my hair with all my peers on our way to the Uvinda Mountains. And I thought it couldn't get any better than this. It was so wonderful knowing that Dad was there. He'd take us up and whip. He had a Brother Lang in the war. Somehow he ended up with a rap. And Brother Lang, who was a painter, had this special paint that he would put on the raft. It was supposed to make it impervious to getting any bricks or holes in it. And we wrapped it around the lake for a while and finally we turned it over as the kids we were and started playing King of Bunker's Hill on the raft, throwing each other off the raft. And Dad would sit up there, sit up on a rock and stretch out on a rock in the sun and read a Louis Lamar. I think it was his time to get away. He always would, and would raise hell the whole time running around and knocking down trees and the raft, the, the paint that was on the raft came off and you could see everywhere on the entire lake where the raft had been. And uh, finally Dad said, we got to get it out of the water, we're going to get in trouble. <laughs> so we, we had to get it out of the water. And, you know, family time, I guess, or uh, some individual time. With ten kids, that was a tough thing to do. And I remember waiting anxiously for my time where I dad had set aside a weekend just to be with me. And I looked forward to it with great anticipation. And what I decided to do, and he'd do whatever he wanted to do that weekend. And I decided we'd ride our bikes to Gibson's and look at fishing gear. That's what I wanted to do. So yeah, rode his bike all the way to Gibson's from our house. That's no small feat, but uh, I, I remember at the end he said, I don't know if I'm going to ride a bike with the kids on the next one. I think we'll leave it at that. So, Dad was as Lance said, stern, but he was loving. <laughs> Excuse me. He uh, truly spread the rod. In his case, it was the belt. You knew if you were in trouble. I probably count on one hand how many times I can remember I, I received the belt, but um, you knew that that uh, if he gave you a look that you were in trouble and you'd, you'd step in line. I think that's how you keep ten kids in line. Is all you had to do was give us a look. Although he spared the rod. As the scripture says, and we love this song, he made each and every one of us feel so important. Like we were the very most important person at the time as, we were, as he was visiting with us. And what I most remember about Dad, as I look back, the most important thing to me. He was an honorable priest in Holden. I remember getting up on some days, coming upstairs. And Dad would be sitting in the green chair by the front door, studying the scriptures. He always had a red pencil in his head. He didn't think that you could study scriptures and read the scriptures until I was older. Went on my mission without a pencil in your hand. Dad would always scratch. notes and things in the margins, what he was impressed with. He always made us gather together and heal in family prayer. I distinctly remember him and Mom frequently getting their little suitcases and heading off to the temple.
and he was as regular as clockwork. It didn't matter if they were less active or, or active. He was always able to get in. He had a disarming way of being able to talk with everybody. And they all loved him to come, even if they were active. And Dad, to his fault sometimes, trusted everybody. He thought everybody was just like him. And he would always extend a trust many times that God even played in places or in circumstances that he was taken advantage of, but he was always so trusting. We need to be on the cut of the path. Dad lived his life on the cut of the path. Never be clear. I know he has the tokens and signs necessary. So, my dad 
proceeded to inform him that he needed to drop all of the underwear in the drawers, and he then got lashings with the belt. And when I told this to all my nieces and nephews, specifically Troy's children, they looked at me in just absolute disappointment. And I was happy about that until Troy informed them that it was me who did that with my father. I was the one who put on all the underwear. But my father was a very loving man, and my memories of my father are very dear. And again, it's, it's been stated over and over of his love for our mother. And uh, his stern discipline and always understanding that you were loved. I aspire to be, and never will be, the man my father is, but I aspire to be, and hope that my children can be like their grandfather. Thank you. I want to express my appreciation to all those who have helped participated today in making these services such a success. Uh, what a tremendous tribute to Gary. Uh, I need to recognize a few individuals, quite a few individuals, before I lose my place in where I'm at. We'd like to recognize the pallbearers that will participate here at the church. And they are grandsons, Braden Spencer, Jordan Spencer, Jesse Spencer, Logan Spencer, Rigdon Spencer, and son, Trent Spencer. The Paul Bears that will serve at the cemetery are grandsons Brad Burton, Eric Burton, Dallin Spencer, Tegan Christiansen, Landon Spencer, and Riley Spencer. And the honorary Paul Bears are a brother, Rod Spencer, with son in laws Ross Burton, Joss Becerra, Nate Dela Cruz, and Jordan Christiansen, and grandsons Dax Christiansen, Brock Christiansen. Cain Christiansen. Following my remarks, uh, we will bring this, these services to a close by singing hymn number 100, Near My God to Thee, after which we will be privileged to have a benediction offered by Glade Tuckett, a brother-in-law. Brother Following the services, uh, brothers and sisters, the internment will be in the Veterans Memorial Cemetery at Camp Williams. There will be, I just want to remind you, there will be no formal procession, so please obey all traffic laws and rules. Uh, and I believe there will be a luncheon here after the services, uh, so we turn back here. You know, great, it brought great pleasure uh, to me to hear of Gary's interests and likes and some of the same things that I found joy and happiness in in my life. Uh, such as scouting in the gospel, uh, serving a mission, and being of service to others. And as I mentioned, it's been my privilege over the last 18 months to serve as the branch president. Four months after I was called to be the branch president, this horrible pandemic, pandemic hit us. And the residents were not permitted to uh, go to the dining room. They were not permitted to have any activities. They were not permitted to go to sacrament service. All of these, and they were not permitted to have outside influence or outside guests. All of the things that they held so dear to their heart were taken from them. Three months later, we were permitted to, help to provide the sacred words of the sacrament, which the residents yearned for and so looked forward to. I had a very small pool of resources to help me my wife and I can committed to quarantine ourselves to home so that we would be permitted to minister at the branch. So outside of myself, I had a very small pool of resources, priesthood brothers, to help with that sacrament, offering that sacrament to the residents. Gary was one of those good brothers. Those of you that are familiar with the layout of the Spring Gardens facility, it has two hallways on the east, one upstairs and one downstairs.
through hallways on the west, one upstairs and one downstairs, and a memory care facility. The first time we offered a second, I recruited six brothers to help. And Carrie was one of those brothers, who was kind enough and worthy enough to exercise his priesthood to help facilitate that offering of the sacrament. Those good brothers, six of them, took those three hallways. I took one hallway and memory care by myself. And we set out to offer the sacrament, the ordinance of the sacrament, to 115 branch members. And we went door to door with ample bread, ample water, and cups, trays, and sacrament prayer cards, and prepared and blessed the sacrament in every room. Three hours later, these good brothers were wore out as we completed that task. And I decided I can't put those aging brothers through that. I was wore out, my back was sore. And I could only imagine how these elderly brothers felt. Not a single complaint. So one month later, we changed our plan. We set up a centrally located sound system in a hallway. The residents would sit in their hall doorways in their walkers or in their walker or in their wheelchairs. We would perform the ordinance of the sacrament and offer it in a hallway, move to the next hallway. We got it all done in about an hour. Gary helped on several occasions. I was so appreciative of that. Um, I wish to express my love to my Heavenly Father for the opportunity that He has given me to serve at Spring Gardens and to play a very small part in uh, my association with the good residents and the branch members there at Spring Gardens. I had the privilege of meeting a couple of times one on one with Gary and Diane as they welcomed me into their apartment uh, to meet my obligations as a branch president. And they always welcomed me with open arms, made me feel like a true friend. I uh, want to express my appreciation to you as a family for giving me this opportunity to conduct these services. And I leave my testimony with you, knowing how grateful we are and as grateful we should be of our knowledge of the plan of salvation and the chance that we will have to reside with Gary once more. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're now sing our closing hymn and have our benediction.
Father, for the legacy that he has left, as we are blessed by his children and the loving words that they gave during this proceeding. Above all, Father, we thank thee for the gift of thy only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, through whose atonement, the resurrection, and eternal life is a certainty for Gary and for all of us. We ask a special blessing on Diane and his special family, that they may be comforted, and a blessing that I'm sure will be the greatest desire of Gary, that his family, his wife, his children, and his grandchildren will all be able to return to be with him in heaven in time. And that no soul shall be lost. May we cherish his memory. And may his influence not only be felt through his children, but also his children's children. Through generations. Is our prayer. Until we meet again. In the sacred name.